everyone. My name is Isabella Lee. I'm the founder of Musica. Over the summer, I had an opportunity and a great honor to sit down with pianist Eric Liu at the Boston Steiners. Eric shared his thoughts on many important topics. And our conversation started with this very question. What are the responsibilities of a musician? So we have a big responsibility because these, these works of art created by these greatest, greatest composers, these great geniuses, they, they created such complex, great works. I mean, such a endless variety of outputs and music making is very, very complicated but in general you have to have a story to tell and do it with great conviction and spontaneously. There's a, there's a message in each piece uh, and of course it's, it's constantly changing. Things, uh, music is constantly evolving, it's just like life. I mean, each day we feel differently, each day we hear something and it will, it will, we will think different thoughts and that's, that's what makes it so great, it's always so fluid. But end of the day, you have to, at least in your own way, your own feelings about the character of the piece and your conviction of the, you know, the message, this, this kind of sonic space feels and then transmits to to people listening and to yourself as a performer uh, this is a I mean, it's, it's the main purpose of what why we we do what we do what's your process of get deep into the music the score and understand what composers are trying to communicate some people have a misconception about quote-unquote respecting composers mm -hmm. intention where they become they just put themselves in a box of of uh, exactly you know you just just ex exactly what's written and and not really thinking beyond that of course it is most ideal to to everything what's what's written but um, Music is so much beyond, so much more beyond that. The, I mean, these kind of messages and, and how, what you're trying to convey in the music goes far beyond maybe some of the smaller details of how, how you plan a phrase or whatever. Um, of course, the main, the main difference is you cannot make it about yourself. You cannot, it's not, oh, I want to do it like this, and then that's it. It's, you have to have, conviction that you want to do it like this because you really believe that that is in the that is in the message and then the temperament of the composer and then then this is something that is you can only build up over time over experience you know listening to to most of the works of Schubert or Bach or or Beethoven you know living with these pieces over time, I'm trying to entering entering the world of the, of the person. I mean, we talk about this later, but like, for instance, for me, I find I, I think Fr Franz Schubert is probably my favorite composer, and it's just the more I listen to him, the more I play him, the more I feel like I know him. It's, it's kind of strange. It's a, just like I know just the person behind all of this, and and that ultimately is, I think how you respect the composer's wishes. I mean, they wrote these pieces for a reason, not just to be reproduced in a, in a very academic manner. Uh, music is to be experienced, performed in so, with, you know, heart and blood and tears and all of that. And you know, the, the detailed works of how to, it's all very important. You have to, or else you're just generalizing everything. You have to, you know, you have to be as knowledgeable as you can, you, you can about, the structure of the piece, the harmonies, the, the, just the way, yeah, the way the piece is constructed, like a the master craftsmanship. Because the, all these great composers, they were, their music is so touching, so moving, but they were such master craftsmen. I mean, ultimately, Bach, Beethoven, 
Mozart, Chopin, absolutely, Franz Schubert, you know, that these are Brahms. <laughs> this is a, there's so much content in the music. So I, I feel like, uh, yeah, like Rahman said, his lifetime is not enough for music because you can really just dig into a piece forever. It's, it's endless. We often talk about great pianists all have their individual and unique sound. Could you tell me a little bit about your thoughts on this? Yeah. Of course, uh, I mean, these kind of things, they, it's, it's built up over many years. Um, sound is something I, I really value a lot in, in piano playing. Uh, the beauty of sound, variety of sound, yeah. uh, color, in the infinite kind of nuances you can get is, is very important. But mainly it first starts from the ear. So you have to know what you want. You have to, you have to feel it, you have to hear it. Um, music, sound can never be for its own sake. It has to have in the context of what you're, what you're playing. Um, but so you have to have a very specific idea of what, what you want to convey in this passage or that passage. Of course, you always have to have some sort of tension um, in your, maybe, maybe here, your breathing, but the sound has to, has to breathe. No matter how pianissimo you play, it has to have transparency, because the variety means you right. should be all kinds of different sounds. I mean, every, every great pianist has their own totally different way of playing, own different technique, their own hearing, and the sound has to be unique. It has to be unique to to yourself. It has to be in your it's an extension of your personality, um, an extension of the, the music. But I don't it, it, let's say specifically Mozart's. I think a firm uh, tip tip of the finger is very important. Um, it's like this tip of the finger sound. This transparency but loose, for instance, something like this. If I, if I was just tight and just went down, I mean, that's a different sound. It's, it's a bit more dead, right? But something, this is, has, has this kind of blossom afterwards. That was not so good. To be different then. So. You have to have a release of tension after you play a note. Mm -hmm. The rest of your fingers cannot be tense along with the the finger you just played. Mm. This is very important. Um, certain classical repertoire, you have to have a bit more of a structure shape in your hand. Uh, in, in romantic repertoire, it's even more important to be completely relaxed, uh, that your, your, your certain fingers are not tied to another. That's truly the independence. Independence finger is not necessarily oh, how high you can lift it on its own, but it's really that it speaks on its own that it doesn't affect the other finger's movements. and. I think that's a hallmark of good technique in general for, for everything, that you're able to release tension very fast and independence in that way. So, so in Chopin, I think that sometimes sets apart the artist is that, that, that legato. Talk a little bit about that legato sound that you're achieving. You cannot play the same way in anything. Uh, that's number one. In general, I think the most important thing about legato is the ear. Right. You hear the connection between the notes. It's not necessarily you forcing a connection with your finger. Actually, sometimes that's doesn't. That actually. It's, it might seem like it's legato, but mm. then the sound doesn't speak. The sound doesn't really have much of a connection because each note is unable to have different variety from each other. Something if four notes are the same sound in the same timing. It's not really going to be legato, no matter how connected it may seem, because it's it's simply just flat. This is just one example. You can you can really you can play legato without even connecting the fingers. 
So something like Schumann, Einsame Blumen, um, this passage, or is this one? Mm -hmm. sound here where it just it blossoms, it shines, it's transparency. So I don't want actually the this legato sound. It's more so actually actually sort of disconnecting, but it's still a legato because of how it's how the notes connect to each other and um, <clears throat> this is something of course you cannot do that all the time the, but there's uh, ultimately it is about the ear and and to not have a tense tense uh, arm and wrist. Yeah. Do you so, deal with tension at all? Sure. Yeah. For sure. This is something I have to work on all the time. How to how to deal with the physical problems of playing the piano. <laughs> Do you have a certain things that you sort of remind yourself, for instance, you, you notice yourself? You have to tense. notice tension. So I think when I was younger, I didn't really pay attention to I wasn't specific in noticing my attention in certain uh, elements of what I was doing. Um, the more you break things down, practice slowly, um, you, you're able to pay attention to, to such things um, on the very minute scale from the fingers to the wrist to the to the arm to the shoulders to how you sit at the back yeah, all, all, all those things even even your legs and then it, it gets tense it's, it's not helpful for the <laughs> for the play on stage is very different it's so naturally more more nervous um, depending on the concert depending on also how how many times you've played a piece in public then you're more nervous or not <laughs> this is Something you with experience, you're able to calm down and able to make sure you're you're doing things things correctly and not out of out of control uh, on stage. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Do you have a certain routine that to get yourself relaxed or certain things you think about? I don't know. I think the most important thing you have to remind yourself is to all the work, the specific work technique. Uh, planning that's done in the practice room on stage you have to kind of forget about it you have to just play the music in its purest form and focus purely on music and usually that's better than worrying worrying about all kinds of things I mean the, uh, that's one thing that can go wrong is, is fear and worry and that's uh, it's happened still it happens all the time but you have to try to block that out psychologically. Performance psychology is a totally different subject. Ultimately, you have to have, you have, to have confidence in your, in your abilities to, to do it, because it's a, it's a big task to go on stage and you're putting yourself out there. So this inner true confidence, not, not something that's it's built up over preparation and experience. And there's so many things you can think about, worry about, oh, what's this note? What's the, how do I play this passage? Most important thing, music. Think about the music. And also try to create it spontaneously. You, of, course, of course, when we're preparing repertoire, there's certain plannings that we do about interpretation, but you have to create it at the moment, like it's as if you haven't maybe heard this piece before discovering it but of course you cannot do like that in reality but I mean that the music will come out fresh and, and yeah spontaneously yeah I, I bet you do take risks sure sure you, you have to yeah sometimes you will surprise yourself oh, oh um, I mean in good ways and bad ways so. what's your typical day like Eric with all the performance like normal I, I I don't 
that is an exorbitant amount. Mm. It always depends on what we feel like that day. Also, you know, how, what do you need to prepare? I mean, nowadays it's it's different from before I had concerts because then it's not exactly a, a schedule where. But now it's like yeah, there's, there's many deadlines <laughs> where you have to you know you have to play this piece in two months or whatever, and that that would dictate a lot. Much you need to practice and so forth. Other than that, yeah, I try to just be, be as relaxed as I can. I do many normal things and uh, talk to friends and waste my time on YouTube and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. How far before that you prepare for your, let's say, new piece that you perform in public? Do you usually? have to learn in two months? Or do you like to give yourself six or even a year to learn? It depends on which piece, right? Mm. It, uh, like a Chopin Nocturne is different than the uh, Rachmaninoff Concerto. Mm. <laughs> Obviously, mm. I mean, that's the extremes. Right. But I, I, I'm definitely on the camp of I, I like to give pieces as much time as possible. Mm. I, I don't like to rush, rush things because it's never going to be as good. I mean, even if you, many people have the ability, they can learn fast, but it's always better in, in if you've played it for six months than when you played it for two weeks. Yeah. And always, no matter how much you practice the practice room, then it's, the next step is stage experience. I find p pieces must have stage experience, and it, it, that brings it to a totally different level than when you're just working at home. What do you mean by that, stage experience? It's just the way the brain works. When you perform a piece, you know you enter this different level of concentration and understanding, and actually doing it, living through. Oh, how does it feel? How does how do I feel in this moment? How do I, and yeah, like for instance, when I first played the Mozart D minor concerto, I mean I had, I know the piece by ear for years, and I actually it was this was during pandemic time, so I had actually spent a pretty good deal of time practicing it at home so I wouldn't say it was one of those things that I felt I felt it was okay it's good it's ready for the first performance but still first performance after I, I felt like I didn't really know the piece at all but there's a totally different thing when you're hearing a recording versus when you're actually playing with your orchestra because then you then you really have to know okay which instrument is playing this part which voices you're playing with especially in Mozart it's all chamber music so it's how do you play with this this voice, how do I, I mean, there's very sophisticated kind of listening you have to do that you cannot really ever get just practicing by yourself. Of course, the more experience you have, the more you realize, okay, how do I actually have to wire my brain at home to speed up this process? But ultimately, it's impossible. Pieces need a lot of experience on stage to get better. So that's why when I, in my planning, I try to to not play a piece for the first time in a huge venue, <laughs> or then that's not a not a good idea. Yeah, yeah. try to maybe start it in in this maybe a smaller place or, or something. Yeah. <laughs> when you uh, prepare that big performance, do you actually try to play for people first? What's your preparation to get that piece feel ready for the stage? Actually, I I would say it's beneficial. I, Record yourself, play for people, etc. But sometimes I don't have that chance. Or mm -hmm. I, recording myself, I really, I, I hate doing because it's you have to then listen <laughs> back, and that's very painful to hear. <laughs> hear, and often with a bad quality, you, it doesn't really tell the whole picture. Um, but even a piece that I, I would never go into a studio recording a piece that I haven't lived with for a while. Mm. And even that, because then I, after that I have to edit it, so then I actually really do have to listen to myself. And I learn a lot. Somehow, it's like, then I play the piece even better after I did the recording. <laughs> For sure, yeah. Each person is different, different. each piece different, depending right. on right. comfort of the piece, the technical challenges of the piece, the composer. It, yeah, certain composers I play often, especially those three composers we talked about today, would be a, a little bit easier on the kind of aesthetic, atmospheric side of entering that world than 
a composer I haven't played as often, or even like Bach, a composer I listen to all the time, but haven't played that much on stage, is so much more difficult to play on stage. It's a totally different mindset. Yeah. When you play a concerto, how much did you have to really get yourself knowing the orchestra score? Of course, best is to know it as yeah, know it very well. <laughs> know as best as you can. Uh, know what other voice are you playing with. Like that example I, in the Mozart beginning. How knowing that voice totally changes how you voice your own part. And, and uh, also things like... I mean, no, this, this passage... Analysis, the harmony, how the, then that influences your inner hearing. Um, but certainly in a concerto, you have to. It's just like you have to think. It's, it's just like chamber music. Uh, you have to know know the parts, and yeah, of course, like anything, the more you know the music, usually the better the, the outcome. <laughs> Do you usually get the second piano to rehearse first before the orchestra? Usually, yes, but I don't always do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How easy or how hard it is to work with conductors? I mean, it all depends on the person. Okay. Most of the experience I've had, they they've been very yeah. They tried. They ask you, you know, you usually you have a meeting beforehand, you go through tempos, sort of a general feel of interpretation, but that usually doesn't accomplish as much as when you're simply rehearsing with the orchestra. Right. Um, and it's just like anything, then it's you have to deal with the, the human element. Um, I feel quite blessed uh, to, to work with many conductors and they, you can learn a lot from them, how, how, they, how they interact with the music, the, the players, with you, and how the gestures of the conductors uh, a lot of these gestures, it's, it can definitely also play into a role you can learn and, and incorporate into how you play, play the music. Have you ever encountered situations that conductors doesn't agree with you? Oh sure, yeah. If, if you find it convincing, their idea, you follow along, um, yeah, you have to find the balance. You know, sometimes when, when to stick up for your, what you want and when to accommodate. It was just like anything else. Certainly, you should uh, look at the conductor uh, and look at the musicians when you can, when you any performance. The kind of eye con certain things need eye contact, definitely. But mainly, listening. You will always collaborate better musically, logistically, lit literally being together if you listen to them. If you only listen to your own part, then you really have no idea what's going on. You're not going to really be together musically, nor nor actually together together. So I guess that's another what I mean by knowing the piece. So you have you have to know it well enough that you can have that you sh should have this one ear on on the other players and the conductor. What are some of your dreams for the future? I mean, certainly, uh, generally, I would love to to keep doing what I'm doing, perform for the rest of my life, uh, but. Have a, have a happy life, not, not too stressful. And I mean, performing is very difficult, it's very stressful. So, this, this balance and keep digging, try to be a better musician. Certainly, of course, like there's these great orchestras in the world that would be wonderful to play with. Uh, I, I would love to play with the Berlin Phil. I mean, that's, yeah. a, that's like the ultimate for, for every, every musician. Do you have a favorite venue, a hall, or a few halls that you feel like? You're so connected to that space. There's some wonderful acoustics I've played in. Uh, intimacy, chamber music, sort of making Wigmore Hall in London is mm. really great. And also you feel that people really, really listen and pay attention. I mean, those, that audience is such connoisseurs of music, which can be a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. <laughs> it's, uh, they, I feel they really, they listen uh, Warsaw Philharmonic is wonderful acoustic. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, usually, it's the halls that you feel has great resonance, but not too watery, where the sound has has magic, has life. You can do magical things, and that you can play, you can whisper, that it will still be be heard and magical. Often, I I prefer you the halls that you bring the audience in. You can play pianissimo, and they will hear it from the back row. That I think those those are the kind of ideal ideal venues. Do you have any advice for young musicians who are trying to make it at a conservatory level? Just encur- word of encouragement, perhaps. You have to stay true to yourself. Stay true to the music. In a very sincere way, I think making music has to be sincere.、Um, you have to, of course, be very ambitious. It's a very competitive field, but also not let that drag you down. I remember all, all for the all for the arts. So that's the that's the the main thing. The message you always have to keep in mind through any difficulties and challenges. That there's many. There's this. It's not an easy thing at all. A child falling asleep. It's a、uh, sound. Sound world is extremely atmospheric and tender and heavenly. And、uh, the way the piece ends, it really goes to the heavens.、Uh, to prepare for this one, their Dichter Schrift, one of the most profound. Pieces written in such few, so few notes.